It is uh, good to be continuing this journey that we uh, started a few weeks ago through the Minor Prophets together. I, I hope that you're digging this series. I hope that, you know, that's been something that's been interesting to you, especially when we talk about books of the Bible. Like, interestingly enough, you know, uh, Tim uh, shared with you about Jonah, books of the Bible that usually don't get preached a whole lot. They, they may not get taught a whole lot. And, and books like last week in Obadiah, you know, I mean, how many times have you heard a sermon in Obadiah? Well, if you're here last week, you know one, right? And so uh, books like Amos the week before, many people aren't too familiar with these uh, minor prophets and, and these smaller books of the Bible. But I hope that you're able to see as we're going through the series, because the name of the series is kind of what it's about, you know, minor prophets with major messages. I hope you're being able to see how these major messages are for us. And, and they're really challenging, right? I mean, they're really insightful. In fact, you miss one, you can go online, you can check it out, you know, and get caught up. But, you know, these, these things are, you know, the, the, the prophets aren't just speaking to the people in their day and age, right? They're not just speaking to people in the Old Testament, not just speaking to people in the New Testament, talking to all of us. There's, it's the word of God speaking to us. We said this before, God's word is alive, right? The Bible says it's living, it's active, it's working, it's moving. God's word is illuminating, you know, you know things in our life that we need to hear, that we need to know, that we need to act on. And so with that said, we're going to kind of jump right into our next minor prophet this morning that has, like I said, a major message. Interestingly enough, with all the things I just said, it's one of the minor prophets. As you think about the 12 that we're going to be doing in the series, it's the one of the 12 that generally speaking, you know, I said the, those other ones you're not too familiar with, haven't heard too many sermons on. This is the one exception to those 12, right? Because chances are, this prophet that we're going to be talking about, this minor prophet, you've heard the story at some point in your life. You uh, have at least maybe even as a child in Sunday school, you know, you saw the flannel graph, right, of the story we're going to be talking about. And of course, that is the minor prophet Jonah. I would say that many of us, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but many of us have heard at some time or another the story and the account of Jonah in our life, maybe multiple times, right? For a good number of you, you've heard it many, many times. You've read it, you've seen the VeggieTale movie, you know, about Jonah and the well. And whatever the case is, you have probably some familiarity with this book, with this story, with this narrative account. But here's the deal, and this is kind of the reason I wanted to start with this conversation and kind of go like this, is this is what I want you to know right out of the gate. This narrative account in Jonah that we're going to be talking about describing it, it you know it's really not about the narrative so in other words here's what I want to say about that it's really not about the story right it is a story but it's not about that there's a bigger message here you know that there, for, for a good num number of people whenever they hear Jonah or they reflect back on what they already know about Jonah they kind of get caught up in the story they kind of get caught up in the narrative and I don't want you to do that Jonah is really not about Jonah it's really not about a well it's really not about a giant fish those things play integral roles and parts in the story but it's really uh, you know, sort of like, you know, remember when we did the book of Hosea, for those of you that were here and were part of that, the book of Hosea as, you know, the story of Gomer and, and Hosea, you know, that narrative account and, and how I said, there's a bigger message for us, right? There's a bigger story that is being told. And so God is communicating something that's a much bigger message other than just the story itself. And so, you know, to kind of answer this question, you know, what is the really big thing that God is telling us? What is the really big idea that he's communicating through his prophet Jonah to us? And then out of that, here's what we want to do. We want to kind of say this, what are some, you know, important truths, you know, out of that, that relate to our lives? How can we apply that directly to our life, right? Does that make sense? So that's kind of how we're going to approach this. So if you got your Bibles, you can look there, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. If you brought a Bible with you, you didn't, that's okay. We're going to have the scripture on the wall behind me here. And so you can kind of follow along with us as we go through this. But again, we're not going to be, be able to read the whole book. You're going to have to do that on your own. We're going to start with verse 1 of chapter, uh, chapter 1 in Jonah. Here's what it says. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Verse 2. Arise and go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So 
So right out of the gate here, Jonah receives this word of the Lord. And like so many other prophets, right? I mean, we see this in the prophets, like so many other prophets, I'm sure Jonah was really excited to have this message from God, to have God talk to him and, and to know that he's got this mission, you know, on his life as God's spokesperson in many ways. And I want to kind of, I want I want you to kind of think of it this, this way, because this is not a whole lot different in, in, in many regards in the New Testament as it's, you know, talking to us even and Christians in general of how we are ambassadors of Christ. Some of you may know the verses that even say that, that talk about that, and, and maybe that's news to you, I don't know. But the Bible says, the New Testament says, you are ambassadors of Christ. As Christians, that's who we are. An ambassador is somebody who is this official representative of someone or something. Now, as it, in this case, the Bible says we are ambassadors, official representatives of Christ. The Bible says it's as if God were making his appeal through us. I just want you to hold that thought as we continue on. And so here's Jonah, and he's a prophet. He has this calling on his life. But the problem is, and we see this so often, and, and again, if you've read some of the prophets, you know this to be true. Like a lot of the prophets, the problem is what God is telling him to do, it's something that is going to be really challenging for Jonah. Something that is going to be really challenging. God tells him, okay, Jonah, here's what, I, here's what I want you to do. It's time for you to get up, and I want you to go to wherever it is I'm telling you to go, okay? Here's where I want you to go. I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh. Now, the reason that this is referred to as a great city, just so that you kind of have the backstory here, is that at the time, especially this was written, this, the ancient city, the, it became the, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And so literally this area for hundreds and hundreds of years, there was this battle being waged with all those that surrounded it, like the Assyrians and like the Babylonians, and it would be this seesaw effect of power. So right now, Nineveh, it's got this rich history, right? It's got you know hundreds of thousands of people within its great walls that surround the city. And it's at this really critical turning point. And what we understand how it's described to us, so much so, God says, the wickedness from the city has come up before him. Now, if you hear that, you read that, some of you that have read other parts of the Old Testament that may sound a little bit familiar to you. It, it even goes back and harkens back to centuries earlier when we read about Sodom and Gomorrah and how the wickedness within the cities had gone up before the Lord, before they were radically destroyed by the Lord with fire and brimstone. And so the reason I mention that to you is because it's really describing just how fallen the city had gotten. Things weren't good in Nineveh. I mean, chances are, you know, uh, again, Jonah doesn't give us much detail. He says, you know, there's a lot of violence. We use another minor prophet in Nahum because he is actually a contemporary. He's one that, that followed Jonah in prophecy. He talks about Nineveh as well. And, and he does go into some detail. He says that it was everything from plotting evil against the Lord to extreme cruelty, exploitation of people. There was even a, a lot of prostitution. There was a lot of witchcraft. Nineveh was an evil place. It had fallen on some very hard times. The Bible says it was full of wickedness. Probably a place that you wouldn't want to go vacation, right? Not some place you'd like to go move your family into, start a life together. By the way, do you know where Nineveh modern day is located? I got a picture here, I just wanna show you because it's kind of interesting to me. Interestingly enough, you'll see there, this is the country of Iraq and the northern part of that is where Nineveh is located. Still not a place that you would like to go vacation, is it? Still not a place you'd like to move your family to. However, this is exactly, and the reason I wanna show you this, this is exactly where God tells Jonah that he is to go and to preach. And so essentially what God is telling Jonah to do here, he's saying, I want you to go 
to this country, this area, these pagans. I want you to go to these people that are considered outsiders. I want you to go to these outcasts. I want you to, you know, go to these people that, listen, I know, I get it. You normally wouldn't talk to these kind of people, right? You normally wouldn't, you know, uh, associate with these kind of people. In fact, Jonah, I want you to go to your enemies, the people that I know that you don't like very much. And again, you need to be thinking about this, even how this applies to us. I want you to go to those people that, uh, who you don't associate with, who are worshiping false idols, you know, I want you to go to them and I want you to preach to them and I want you to share with them the truth about me. Can you do that? So it sounds like a reasonable request from God, doesn't it? So what's Jonah's response? Verse three. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So what's Jonah's response here? Again, for those of you who know the story, you already know, he's fleeing from the Lord. He's running from God. He's running from God's calling on his life. God's like, okay, uh, Jonah, it's time for you to get up and I want you to go. Jonah's like, okay, God, I'm listening. No, no. And he begins to run from God. And, 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 and here's one of the really big truths that, that I wanna glean from this story. And it's one that I think genuinely each one of us should wrestle with in our own lives. And we'll try to flesh this out a little bit more as we go along this morning. But the truth is simply this. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes God calls us to do things that we don't really wanna do. Again, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes God calls us to do things that we don't really wanna do. Now, before we get into that a little bit deeper, let's answer a fundamental question that kind of goes along with it. Why, right? Why, why does God do that? Why would God sometimes ask us to do things that we don't want to do? Well, let me just give you the short answer, okay? And this is not gonna satisfy hardly any of you, but I just wanna give it to you just because this is kind of how God reacts most of the time in the Bible. You know why? Because he's God, right? I know, it's like, okay, well, great answer. That's huge theological concept, Will. Thanks for saying that, you know, but I know that doesn't suffice. So I wanna go a little bit deeper into this, you know, uh, of answering this why question. Why does God sometimes do that to us? Well, part of the answer to this question is simply this, because God, you know, because he's God, because God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And I know you've, you've heard me say this before. You've heard many people say it before. You may have read it many times that, that God has created us. We see this all through the Bible. God has created us on purpose and for a purpose. God has created us on purpose and for a purpose. And, and I hope that you know that this morning, God has a plan and a purpose for you and it's his plan. And let me just say, when it's his plan, it's not necessarily, guess what? Your plan. It's the truth. And the reason is quite simple. Sometimes, not all the time, again, sometimes what we want and what we want to do in life doesn't match up with what God wants and what he expects of us. And when that happens in our lives, the result is always conflict with God. It's always conflict with his plan and his will for us. That's what we're seeing here in Jonah's life, right out of the gates. God has this plan for him. Jonah knows what that plan is, but he doesn't want to do it. So one of the really big questions, again, something we have to wrestle with, one of the really big questions is, so what do you do when God tells you to do something that you don't want to do? Maybe even before we begin to answer that question, 
for ourselves, we should answer another, again, a more basic question. How do we even know that God is speaking to us, right? I mean, because here we see God speaking to Jonah. So how do we even know that God is speaking to us? Maybe that's where we should begin. And and because of that, I mean, I, I believe it's a good question, you know, I, you know and, and because of the fact we've already even stated this because it's so important that our God is actively present in our lives, right? We understand that, right? God is God is not a dormant God. He is an active God. We see this from the very beginning about it all, all, all the way through throughout the Bible that God is active. He wants to communicate with us, right? He wants that close relationship with us. We see this in his attributes. We see this in his characteristics that, that God, you know, wants us to be in close relationship with him. He wants to communicate with us through the Holy Spirit, right? It's the reason he's given us the Holy Spirit to dwell with us, right? The book of Ephesians chapter five, verse 18 says we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? That's one of the ways that God communicates to us. I mean, Jesus even said it like this in John chapter 10, verses three and four is Jesus is describing this relationship. He says, the sheep, who's the sheep? That's us, right? We are the sheep. The sheep listen to his voice and his voice talking about himself, Jesus as the shepherd. He calls his own sheep by name, leads them out. And when, when he has brought them all, uh, brought, bought all of them out of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because, and here's the key, because they know his voice. See, it's about this closeness with the shepherd where we know and experience his presence in our life and we follow him. Not only that, but we mentioned this last week, and so I don't want to go into it at, at length, but we, we were talking about God's word, how we've been given God's word, where we study, we read it, we listen to other people preach it, teach it, where God uses his word to speak into our lives, right? And we listen, we hear, we know the spirit of God illuminates, right? The pages of scripture so that we, you know, know what God is saying to us. Not only that, but, but how many of you know this? How many of you know that other Christians, God can use other Christians to speak to us? You know that to be true? He can. Your friends, that's the reason it's important to surround yourself with, with quality relationships in Christ where God can speak to us through our people in our life. And he does that all the time. Here's what I found to be a key in this conversation, and that is when it comes to God speaking to us, the biggest problem that I found, maybe you have too, but I found isn't allowing God to use his word or the Bible to speak to us or allowing God to use other Christians to speak to us. What I found is it's simply this idea that for me at least, I gotta get rid of all the distractions in my life that I can in order to hear God, no matter what it is because I am constantly distracted. You know, I, I don't think that I have ADD, but I don't know, maybe I do. I feel like I'm constantly distracted, I'm constantly bombarded. Maybe you're like me. And one of the things that we just simply gotta do is get rid of some distractions that are in our life. We just simply gotta get still before the Lord. I, I was thinking about that this week and I was thinking, you know, that's exactly as we, if we look at another prophet in the Bible in Elijah, that's exactly what the prophet Elijah had to do. At one point we read in the Bible about Elijah in, in first Kings that he was running for his life, okay? He was literally running for his life. The Israelites had done such evil in the eyes of the Lord that they had killed literally all of the prophets except for him. And so he inquires of the Lord. He's like, Lord, I don't know what to do. And so he went to talk to God. The Bible says that this great and powerful wind tore through the mountain, but it says God wasn't in the wind. And then it says that there was this, you know, a powerful, violent earthquake that happened, but it says God wasn't in an earthquake. And then it says this ferocious fire broke out, but it says God wasn't in the fire. And finally it says there was this gentle whisper that happened. And that's when Elijah knew that God was communicating to him. And sometimes, you know, the same thing is true of us. We've got to cut out everything that we can, cut out all the distractions, cut out our busy schedules, and just simply get still and quiet before the Lord so that he can whisper and talk to our hearts. And here's what I think you're gonna find out about that. It's not so much how do we know when God is speaking to us, 
What I found out, maybe again, you have found out this as well. What I find out is it's not that if, this question of if God is speaking, because like we mentioned, I mean, God is actively present, right? He, he is always moving, he's always doing, he's always being. He's trying to communicate to us through various ways, his word, other Christians, the Holy Spirit through prayer. The question isn't if he's speaking. The question becomes, am I listening? It's can I hear him? Are, are we getting into the right frame of mind and situation where we can even hear God and respond to him? And since we're talking about this for just a moment, let, let me give you just a, a few more things here around this topic. One of the things that we know to be true when God speaks is that when God talks to us, when he communicates to us, it's not controlling. And that's important to talk about it. In other words, God's message to us is not something that will be forceful. It won't be manipulative. One of the things we see from scripture and, and literally just generally in life we see this is that God always, always, always gives us a choice. Like we mentioned last week when we were talking about the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they had, they had a choice, didn't they? When we were talking about Cain and Abel, they, they had a choice, didn't they? We talk about Jacob and Esau, they had a choice. And in the New Testament, as Jesus tells a story, he tells all kinds of stories, all kinds of, of, of parables, as he tells a story of the prodigal son, right? As, as he tells that story, he, he comes to, you know, the, the son comes to the father and he asks for his inheritance so that he can spend it on lavish and wild living. And the father gives him a choice to make. And so, what that's a reflection of is that's who our God is. He, he doesn't just bust down the doors of our hearts, does he? In fact, the Bible describes how Jesus stands at the door and he knocks and he waits patiently for anyone to open the door and let him in and he will come in. And the same thing is true here in this story of Jonah, God gave him a choice and allowed him to choose. And Jonah did choose. He chose not to go the path that God had called him to go. He, he, he chose, in fact, a path in the opposite direction. I mean, literally, as you look at a map, it's literally in the opposite direction. Jonah's hometown was Goth Heifer. And, and so uh, as you look at the map, and, and I got a map here I wanna show you here, uh, it was a little over 500 miles due west of Nineveh. So that's where God was calling Jonah to go. So instead of heading east, you know, as the calling is, Jonah, in fact, goes even further west. He chooses to go to to the very most distant city. In fact, in the known world at that time, that was the edge of the world. That was as far as you could go. And so he chose to go to Tarshish, which is over 2,200 miles away to try to get away from God. Tarshish, you can see there on the map, I mean, that's where Spain, the country Spain on the southern end of where that is. It's a long way the furthest place that he could go at that time. Maybe you're here this morning. It's not that you haven't understood at one time or another that God loves you, that he cares for you, that he has a plan and a, a purpose for your life. It's not that you haven't heard God speak at some point in your life, maybe even this morning, it's not, it's not any of those things. It's that you had a choice and you have chosen to run. Maybe like Joni, you think, well, you know, maybe if I can just ignore God long enough, you know, he'll just, he'll, he'll quit trying to speak to me. He'll just leave me alone. One of the things we see in the story is we quickly see that Jonah kind of had this mindset. And really what we see in the story, it's not, again, it's not the story about Jonah, it's the story about God. God, God doesn't give up on Jonah. 
And while Jonah is literally running from the Lord and, and he's out at sea, he's heading to Tarshish, we read that God causes this great storm to happen. The ship that Jonah is on is about to break apart. It's about to sink. It's about to go down. All the shipmates are fearing for their life. And so Jonah, you know, had already told them why he was on board, what, what he was doing, that he was in fact running from God. And so the crew all come to him. They're like, hey, you know, what have you done to us? What, what, what do you want us to do now? And so in verse 12, Jonah says, he says this, he says, you know, just pick me up, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know he's owning it. I know it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. I just want to pause here for a moment because another important point, and I just want to point this out, is that when God speaks to us, when God speaks to you, it's not always weird. I know a lot of people say that and think that, and sometimes you hear that and you think, oh, it's such a weird thing, but, it, but it's not. It, you know, when we're talking about God speaking to us, we're talking about something that is supernatural because it's God, but it's not super unnatural. Okay, I mean, you know, it's something that, 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 you know, necessarily, you know, doesn't go against reason always, but it is something that goes beyond reason because here's the thing, it always requires faith on our part. Always. That's the reason the Bible says in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Again, it's not so much that God is speaking to us because most of the time, I mean, again, let's just come to this realization. We understand that he's telling you know, us to do something. Yeah, it's true there are some times where we're seeking God's direction, we need his wisdom and, and that does happen. But much of the time, we already know what God is telling us to do. I mean, just, just think about some of the people that we read about in the Bible, some of the examples that we have. I mean, think about, think about Moses, for example. Moses is a great example. When God you know, talks to Moses and tells him what he wants him to do, he tells him, I want you to go, I want you to leave your people out of captivity, out of Egypt, and go to the promised land. It wasn't that Moses didn't understand what God was saying. It's that he thought he had the wrong person, right? Hey, have you seen my brother Aaron? He's better. He's so much better, so much better of a speaker than I am. It's true for us, I think, in life as well. Most of the time, we know what God is telling us. We are just reluctant to do it. And almost all of the time, that reluctance is due to some type of lack of faith on our part. So let me just ask you, if some of the things you're asking God when it comes to whatever it is he wants you to do, are you sure, God? Are you sure that's what you want me to do? Are you sure that's where you want me to go? God, I mean, are you really that good? Are you really that all-knowing? Are you really that powerful? Are you really in control? I mean, do you really know what's best for me? And we know from the story of Jonah that the crew reluctantly, it says, throw Jonah overboard and the sea immediately calms down. In verse 17, it says that the Lord provided this, this, this huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah's, Jonah was in the belly of the fish, giant fish for three days and three nights. And eventually we read that, just like Tim was saying earlier, the fish spewed Jonah onto dry land again and the Lord spoke to him again and this time Jonah listened and he went to Nineveh now there's so much good stuff here and, and unfortunately we just can't do it all this morning there's so many good points and so much uh you know things that we can glean from this but I want to focus here as I kind of wrap up this message this morning because we're going to be doing a series actually uh, a little bit later on this summer in the book of Jonah because I wanted to spend some more time on this. But for now, I want to talk about probably I think the most challenging aspect of what it is we're talking about. And, and it's the reality that when God speaks to us, it's not just to tell us what to do or where to go. It's more than that. Here's to me the bigger picture. When God speaks to us, it's also so that we can get to know and know by meaning experience him more. It's an invitation, as it were. 
It's an opportunity. When God speaks to us, it's an opportunity for us to deepen our understanding and of who God is. It's an opportunity, an invitation for us to grow in our relationship with him as our heavenly father. And, and, and it's so that we can know more about God for sure. It's to, so we can know more about his character and his attributes for sure. But it's also so that we can actually experience more of his presence in our lives. And, and here's the deal. Unfortunately, this is what I think, you know, we miss so much of the time in our own lives is that we, we, we miss this idea that when God speaks to us and, and this fact that we're talking about is that we get caught up, right, in just the story. We get caught up in things like the mundaneness of life and we get caught up in these kinds of things. And it's not so much, again, remember I said, it's not so much about the story. It's not so much about Jonah. It's not so much about the storm. It's not so much about the giant fish. No, it is what God is communicating to us about himself. And what God is communicating to us about himself is huge. He, he's, saying, he's saying through the prophet Jonah, he's saying this, here's my heart. I want you to know what my heart is like. I want you to know the depths of my feelings for you. I mean, here it is, Jonah. Here's my compassion just laid out before you. Here's the depth, in fact, of my love and of my grace. And, 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 and you know, essentially, you know, God is communicating through Jonah. He's like he's saying this, and this is what I think the message is even for us this morning. Do you know how great my love is for you? In fact, not just for you, but do you know how great my love is for this world, for the people of this planet? He says, he says like this, he's like, I, I love you and I only, not only love you in part, but I love you wholly, completely. I love you perfectly. I love not just you, but I love everyone. And this is God's message. And, and I know some of you are thinking, well, Will, that all of a sudden feels, sounds like a feel-good sermon. But listen, this really is the message he is communicating through Jonah that, that, that he loves everyone, even the Ninevites. Remember, we just talked about them. Even those who are being disobedient, even those that are hurting themselves, even those that are hurting other people. God is saying, I love everyone, even your enemies. Yeah, I don't love what they stand for always. God is like, I, I don't always love what they do, but I love them. And man, is that not a message that we as Christians and we as a church need to communicate? It's as if God is saying, Jonah, the reason you've been in the belly of the well for three days it isn't because I don't love, it's because I do. I do love. In fact, I am love. And this is where everything begins to come together and I hope you see this. This is where the story of Jonah actually becomes a part of our own story. This is where we make this connection of God showing his unconditional love for us through this giant fish, right? We don't, we don't know, you know, God, you know, if this is a whale or whatever kind of fish this is, but, you know, God using this giant fish in a miraculous way, and, and this is where we begin to connect all the dots here because this is where we begin to see where Jesus actually takes the place of Jonah. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 and 41, he says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish. So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh, he says, will stand at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here talking, of course, about himself. What is God telling you this morning? What is he telling you to do that's going to require faith on your part? What choice is God laying 
before you right now, giving you the opportunity to do and make that decision? Are you, are you going to do as Jonah originally did and run from God? Or are you gonna do as Jonah eventually did and go with God? You see, there's, there's a guarantee here and it's simply this, that whatever it is, whatever God is speaking to you, I can guarantee that it is so that you will come to know him more deeply. Maybe it's to begin a relationship with him because that's what Jesus has come to provide. Maybe it's to restore a relationship with him because that's what Jesus come to write. You see, Jesus died so that we, you know, it's not so much that, because uh, again, we can get caught up in the story. It's not so much that he can show that after three days, he can raise, God can raise him up from the dead. That's not the purpose of that. The purpose is he died so that we would know and experience just how much God loves us. And I don't want you to run from that truth. I don't want you to run from that reality. In fact, I feel like that the word of the Lord tells us to take that message with us everywhere we go. Share it with everyone that we can, even if it's people that you don't like and the people that don't like you. Let's pray together. Father, we just ask that... um, as we come to a close this morning in our service and on this Sabbath day, Father, that we are gathering as your church, that we are reminded that you speak to us in various ways through your word, through the prophets, through other Christians, your Holy Spirit, through prayer. Maybe one of the things that you're asking on us in this moment, and you're speaking to our hearts, is just simply respond to that message, Father, that you love everyone. And it doesn't matter how far we've roamed. It doesn't matter how disobedient we've been. It doesn't matter to what end of the earth that we are trying to run from you, God. There's nowhere that we can go from your presence. There's nowhere that we can hide. The, the psalmist declares, Father, that if we go to the heights of the highest of the heavens, you are there. And if we go to the depths of the earth, you are right there. And so how do we think we can just hide in this moment? So God, I just pray that as you are doing in me, that you would do the same for all those that are here and are listening, God, that you would have your way in our hearts. And you'll help us respond with courage, compassion, God, because that's your heart. Your heart is a missionary heart, God. And we should have the same feeling and motivation in our hearts. That's what I long for. In my life, Father, you know that's what I long for in our church. Help us to know what it is, Father, that you want us to do in this moment. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to have a closing song today. And as we always do at the close of every service, and if this is your first time here, again, this this may be something new to you, but we're going to have an invitation time. And if you're here and you feel like the Lord has spoken to you, you need to speak to somebody, I will be up front here and, and available for prayer or any kind of questions you have. And even if I'm praying with somebody, we'll have elders that will be able to come forward and pray with you. Even after this service this morning, we'd love to pray with you. But the invitation stands. If you're here and, and God is moving in your heart in whatever way it is, we invite you to come.